this is weird because normally I talk about marketing or talk about identity, talk about connectivity. Um, today I've been asked to talk about like the last eight years of the journey I've been on, which is it's kind of uncharted territory and a little bit weird. Uh, but uh, if I think back to literally about the time that Terry uh, was mentioning, I was sitting at Microsoft, there was a product of an acquisition there, and I thought to myself, I had struck a deal, I was in charge of yield management um, for uh, all of the Microsoft advertising, I ran the Microsoft advertising businesses. So like things like MSN, Windows Live, we repped Facebook's inventory at the time. And I started striking deals with companies like Axiom and Experian um, and others because if we could marry their data to our inventory, we could actually generate a huge increase in the lift. And so I started thinking to myself, hey, this is a pretty interesting business. Someone needs to build the equivalent of like the power grid for data, um, the freeway system for data that anybody could just plug into easy on ramps, easy off ramps. Um, and you know, there would be connectivity for everybody and there would be common identity. And I, I took that, uh, um, I took that idea to my doppelganger and he said, we tried that, it was called Passport and we'll never do that again. Uh, and so from that, I started thinking about, well, who else could do it? And I, uh, when the opportunity came uh, to, at Axiom, they were looking to hire a CEO. I remembered that I had worked with them before and, and you know, nothing was really easy, but they had this incredible identity asset called Abilitech and so, I thought about it, interviewed for the job, and ultimately was successful in it. But uh, what was really interesting when I started, during the interview process, they didn't actually let me talk to anybody who actually worked at the company. I could only talk to, to the board of directors. And so I had like done my equivalent of, of Glassdoor and like trying to learn about the company. I would even written a strategy. Um, but when I started, I found out that it had a lot of problems that many big companies who kind of lose their way at, at one point do. And, and they had just gone through a failed takeover attempt. Um, they had shopped themselves to private equity and ultimately the deal that was arranged had fallen through. Um, there were a number of activist shareholders, all of had strong opinions about what should be done, but a universal opinion that the management team was driving the company into the ground um, a lot of investor impatience about where the company was going. Revenue had really stalled. Um, and then to cap it all off, as I was starting to realize the, these things in my, my first day, just after I was announced, um, the phone rang and it was my largest client, the CEO, um, this woman named Sarah Matthew, and she said, hey, congratulations on taking the job. Now I'm gonna spend the next hour telling you why you've made the worst decision of your life. Um, so it was, it was a challenge, but uh, a great challenge because Axiom had uh, incredible assets. And, and like, again, a lot of big companies maybe had just lost their focus along the way. And, you know, I went in and I started talking about burger shakes and fries. I didn't talk about focus. I just talked about burger shakes and fries. And in my first company meeting, I put on a, a picture of burger shakes and fries and said, you know, what is our equivalent of burger shakes and fries? Because before we're gonna add McCookies to the menu or McSalads or McBreakfasts or anything, let's make sure that we make the best burger shakes and fries in the world. And so out of that started a journey and I'm not gonna take you through this like really awful eye chart. I'm just gonna tell you about some key things. So when I started, um, when I actually started at the, the company, the stock price was at nine bucks. Um, which isn't all that interesting. What happened in the next week was interesting because before I even started the job, uh, I, did a, I wrote a strategy. So I wrote a 30-page strategy, and then I went about and I tried to do three things, and, and it's those three things that are important. Number one, I crowdsourced what I had written. So um, a lot of you are, are smaller companies and you know, maybe meeting, looking for money, with, uh, with venture capitalists. Others of you are later stage, maybe even talking to private equity. And what I had realized is that, you know, when I had done startups, every time I met with an investor, they would write a book. They'd write an investment thesis. And so Axiom had just gone through a failed private equity takeover process. And so I wrote my, my strategy and I called the three or four final private equity Folks, I said, hey, I'd love to bounce my strategy off you. And I went and flew out and I met with them all and I shared that with them and they gave me their books. 
Uh, and so I was able to take those books and look at them right next to what we thought we should do and say, what have I missed? Um, and, and, you know, super valuable. The next thing we did is uh, we, we chose some of the best and brightest people at Axiom. Dave Eisenberg, uh, who's here, helped lead the charge on this. And they weren't like my direct reports. They were the people in the company who really knew how to get stuff done. And, and you know, I assembled them all. I said, this is what we think the strategy is. What do you think? And over the course of a couple months, they tore it apart, they improved it, and all of a sudden, because those people were working on it, we had a strategy that actually made sense, and you know, just by including them, that kind of went viral in the organization and gained a lot of support. And the third thing, and super important thing, is I spent three months talking to every client I could. And I said, we're not gonna publish our strategy until I talk to every major client and in every client meeting, I said, here's what we think our strategy is. What do you think? What are we doing bad? Where should we go? Because I knew that the biggest thing that any manager ever gets is a lot of varnished half-truths. But when you're meeting with the client one-on-one, -on -one, it all becomes crystal clear. There is no lie in that conversation. And so people said, this is what you're good at. This is what you're not good at. This is what we need you to focus on. And oh, by the way, I mean, the good news is they kind of reinforce some of the things I believed, which is the world needed connectivity and a common identity and an easy button for how to use data. And so, you know, we really focused on how do we build a business around those things? And in so doing, how do we divest ourselves of a bunch of things that didn't do that? And so like a lot of companies, Axiom had picked up some things along the way, some traveling companions. They had a security screening business. They had an IT outsourcing business. They had an email business. Um, they had a services business. And a lot of those businesses were really good businesses. But they weren't necessarily core to what we were trying to do. They were great salads, and we were trying to make burger shakes and fries. And so, you know, in, in terms of thinking about, well, how do, we, how do we really focus, it became apparent that just because these were good businesses didn't mean they had to be our businesses. Maybe that they, they would be better businesses if managed by someone else. And so we divested the security screening business in a couple pieces first. That gave us $80 million, and that gave us the funds to invest heavily back into R&D. Um, so the concept of sequencing um, and not trying to do everything at once um, and creating optionality along the way. Let's get some cash, pay down debt, uh, and increase our R&D. And as we increased our R&D, we built this thing called the audience operating system. Pretty successful, it was all about connectivity. It did, I wanna say $30 million ARR in its first year. So much so um, that we decided to spend $300 million to acquire a company called LiveRamp. Um, they were the other company that did this. Um, and, you know, less than humility, uh, they did it better than us. Uh, their, their people were better, their code was better, um, their marketing was better, their client roster uh, was, was really strong as well. And so rather than try to integrate them into Axiom, we integrated our R&D efforts into this space um, that we were pretty nascent still, only a year and a half old, into LiveRamp. Uh, and then we set, aside, uh, set down the course of divesting the IT outsourcing business um, and, and finally got to a place where we had two really nice businesses, a services business and a high growth SaaS business. Uh, and there was increasing uh, uh, issues between the two in terms of which investors wanted to hold and conflicts of interest. Um, and so about a year ago, we divested the services business to IPG. It's done really well at IPG because it's found the rightful home. There's a ton of cross-sell opportunities there. And I think as of today, our stock price closed at, uh, I want to say like 46 bucks or something like that, which isn't that impressive when you consider that uh, a few months ago it was at 55. But uh, relative to $9, I think uh, a, a lot of value was created. And, and so, uh, when Terry asked me to speak today, I thought about, well, what is the, the journey's not that interesting. What were the lessons that we learned along the way that might be relevant to anybody in the room? 
And so um, there are six. Number one, it is far easier to buy a company than sell a company. And our value creation, yeah, it consisted of some strategic acquisitions along the way that fit with the core of our burgers, shakes, and fries, what we're trying to do with identity and connectivity. But it also involved divesting some businesses. And I will tell you, selling businesses, it's really hard. Like when you buy, you, you, you start the process, the clock starts ticking, you do some due diligence, you write the offer letter, and then a few months later, you're done. Um, I will tell you, every time we sold a business, we started one year before we ever went out into the marketplace because you have to start that that much in advance. And you have to start with the no regrets moves, things that give you optionality, even if you decide not to move forward. So for instance, um, Axiom, the Axiom I joined was all kludged together in one giant P&L. And so we created separate P&Ls and lines of sight for each, such that we would have a very clean P&L at the point of divestiture. Likewise, one of the things that I heard from the private equity folks is they said, your process was a nightmare because every time I asked someone on your team for a piece of information, what I thought was a seemingly easy question, you took three weeks to give me back an Excel spreadsheet that often had errors in it with the answer. And so again, it just it, it put an emphasis behind the value of preparation that you have to get things in order, you have to establish your clean room, your data, um, well before you ever enter the process because once you're in the shoot, it happens like that. And you don't have time to go do the analysis. You can't spend three weeks and get a premium valuation for something if you're not operating the business effectively, um, effectively enough to have those answers at your fingertips. How is anybody ever gonna pay you a premium um, even if it is a great asset? Uh, the second thing I learned was that it is even harder to change a culture. And I guess, you know, I went to business school and I've read all the HBR articles uh, ever written, I think, about changing culture. And I went and talked to a lot of HR people about, you know, how do we change stuff? And, and what I realized is when you're walking into an entrenched company or if you're buying a company as well, it's really hard to change the culture. Culture gets entrenched over time. It's a habit. Uh, and, and habits are hard to break, good and bad habits. Um, it's much easier uh, to transform a culture by building a new one alongside. And so what we did is, number one, um, we told everybody, hey, this is the culture we're trying to build. And if you don't want to be part of it, then, then you should go work someplace else. Really transparent. Um, and in areas where we couldn't, affect change quickly enough, um, like uh, we had uh, IT business, uh, our IT internal, uh, we actually built that, uh, took it out of uh, the home office, put it in Austin, hired a new team, um, built it completely in parallel, and then did a cutover. Um, and then likewise, uh, you know, when we, when we bought things, and we bought uh, four or five companies since I've been at Axiom, it's the most important thing we always look for because we know we can't change it. Um, and so we will try to work with companies for a year before we ever start talking about um, doing something more interesting because we want to know um, how do they think? What's their work ethic? What are their values? Number three. An exit isn't, uh, it's not a strategy. It's an outcome of creating a successful business. And I always get really nervous when uh, people say, well, my strategy is to sell to Adobe. That's not a strategy. That's an outcome of building a great company. A and so uh, the important takeaway in this is, you know, even if you're late stage and you're looking for an exit, if you do things that starve your business to dress it up, to make the cash flow better, um, you're inevitably going to do short-term things that hurt the business and hurt the morale in the business. It's much better to say, hey, this business isn't going to be part of our long-term future, but as long as we own it, we're going to manage it such that it succeeds. And in so doing, um, it creates a much better 
uh, valuation conversation, acquisition conversation, divestiture conversation uh, in future because you're talking about a healthy business. And at the time we divested each of our businesses, they were actually very strong, strong P&Ls, growing top lines, um, in many respects the healthiest they had been in, in, uh, in a decade. Uh, in terms of the M&A process itself, I mean, I probably already gave away the punchline to this. It's about relationships, but it's also about um, collaboration and, and having a track record of working together. So I would tell you that we've never sold a business to anybody that we didn't have a long-term relationship with. That gave them a chance to get to know us, get to know the business. Likewise, we've never bought a business that we hadn't worked with um, for a given year. And I will tell you, that makes all the difference because at the 11th hour in an M&A transaction, something is gonna happen. You know, it's gonna be some weird legal letter that crops up or some weird question about the financials, um, but it's gonna come up and at that point, trust is gonna carry the day. Do they know you and do they trust you? And so if you invest in those relationships before you ever get in the shoot, you're gonna have a better outcome. If you take away nothing else, if you're ever thinking about selling or if you're thinking about going public, um, take away this, dress rehearsals, dress rehearsals, dress rehearsals. That was channel channeling my inner Steve Ballmer. Uh, I mean, the, the story about Steve Jobs is that the reason he was able to be so unscripted and so fascinating when he was on stage every time there was an Apple product launch is he spent countless hours rehearsing um, before he ever got on stage. And I will tell you that there is no substitute for rehearsal. So uh, if you put together a book because you're going public or you're looking to sell, then you need to go through every page of that book, have whoever's speaking, give it a number of times, ask them all the hardest questions that you can possibly ask, uh, and do it again and again. And, and you know, the more times that you can get new people as your audience, you know, someone from the investment bank, someone from your board of directors, um, someone who's in the know on the team. Uh, so you have that fresh objective every time you do it. You learn something new, and then by the time you actually get to when it matters, you've heard every question. And so instead of seeming like you're taken off guard by the gotcha question, you go, hmm, that's interesting. Well, this is, this is what we think. And it seems unscripted, but of course it's so rehearsed, and it sounds so authentic and natural. Um, but in doing this, you get to know your business better, and then you'll show up better. And then finally, and, and this is probably the biggest surprise to me, uh, and maybe the biggest surprise to all of you, uh, there are no secrets in companies. No secrets. Uh, and, and so I've always followed the philosophy of like, if I'm making pay decisions, then I better be prepared that someone's gonna leave the spreadsheet on the copier and everybody in the company knows it. And if I can't defend that decision, then I've made a bad decision. Likewise, the rumor mill, if you're thinking about doing something, particularly if you're thinking about divesting a division, um, it goes crazy. There are no secrets. And so if someone doesn't know the truth, they will invent their own reality, and the re their own reality of the rumor mill is far more painful than the reality of just knowing. So we talked, particularly around uh, the Axiom divestiture when we when we sold our services business, that was you know, the bulk of our people and, and, and our revenue at the time. And we said, all right, can we keep this secret? And the answer was no, people were speculating about it already. And so we actually just said, hey, we're exploring strategic alternatives for this business. This is what strategic alternatives mean. Uh, and we walked through the different possibilities. Here's the timeline that we think we're gonna be following. And this is why we're not gonna give you an update on everything that we're doing. Do you have any questions? We'll stay here as long as possible to answer any questions that you have. And we'll create a, a microsite, an intranet site, to continue to answer those questions. Uh, because 
you know, the reality that someone can confirm is far less painful than the reality that they'll invent in, in their head. And, you know, I'll tell you my glass door ratings took a little bit of a hit when we announced that we were, were divesting the division. But because we were so transparent, um, a lot less time was spent on distractions and worrying about the outcomes and a lot more time was just spent building a great business um, and, and getting it ready for sale. So for that, uh, I'm done. Terry, I think you're gonna ask me a couple questions. Or, I mean, this is a small group, I know most of you. Um, so feel free to like uh, ask your own questions. All right. There's, there's really nothing like a successful M&A case study like that to warm the heart, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm sure you felt it too. What I like is your takeaways. Many of the things that you're talking about are things that we talk about uh, with our clients. Uh, things like um, best route to corp dev is biz dev. You know, do not, you should not be being introduced on the way down the aisle in the church, right? That's not the time. Um, uh, the importance of relationships and trust and transparency. You know, on the uh, on the rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. We we have a we have a system we go through with our clients before they engage with the other party, which is it has been called a proctology uh, exam. Connor runs the proctology exam. He's our proctologist. And good luck if you can make it through our diligence. You're going to be just fine with the other side, but I completely agree uh, with you. And now for some unrehearsed questions. Terry, you, you asked me earlier, like you were, you were kind of bagging on us because uh, you said, hey, I heard Eisenberg says that uh, yeah. uh, to the, the companies you want don't to hire, acquire, an don't hire an investment banker. Right. And that's why, because you put them through the rehearsal. And wow. The, that's it. No, trust me. Their, their prep uh, accrues to your uh, benefit. Um, <laughs> And I'm pretty sure, by the way, there, it's like Eisenberg, we are so close. We're kitty corner, our offices at 17th and 5th, and I can get his Wi-Fi and he can get mine, which is probably why we're doing business together. But um, the uh, <laughs> transparency. <laughs> um, so, so look, great case study, but let's face it, hindsight is 2020. It sounds beautiful, like a beautiful thing now that we're on this end of it. My question, my first question to you is, what was you, at what confidence interval did you have when you initially set out on this plan, on this, on this journey? Wh where were you from the standpoint in your discussions with the board as to, look, we're going to give this a try and hope that it works? Were you reasonably successful? Had you any anticipation that it would have accrued to the benefit that it actually did? Yeah, uh, some, of the, some of the steps here were exactly what was in my initial plan. Um, so I knew that uh, the ITO business that Axiom had bought uh, and we later divested really wasn't core to what we were trying to do yep. and would be in much better hands in owned by someone else. And same with the security screening business because it had a lot, a lot of PII and um, uh, wasn't in the same location as the rest of the businesses. So those were easy ones. Uh, there were some moments of, of kind of anxiety along the way. And I, I would tell you like when, when we bought LiveRamp for $300 million and, and basically said their, their stuff is better than ours. Um, together, it's really interesting. I mean, there were, I, like that was the year I didn't get a bonus and, and the board said, if you do this again, you're, you'll, you'll do it at another company. Okay. Uh, likewise, uh, you know, I, I would tell you, our CFO, we have an incredible CFO, this guy, yep. Warren Jensen, oh, wow. twice been named America's best CFO, and he's, he's every, he, he is the best CFO. Uh, he and I had some fierce debates, I mean, arguments where we were kind of going at it toe to toe about uh, what would we do with, with the Axiom Marketing Services business. But the one thing that we always did was follow this, this path of optionality, and, and it's like, I don't know if any of you are poker players, you know, sometimes the best thing to do in poker is to just wait until the next card is shown, you know, and, and then you have a better idea of what your hand is. And, and so um, there were a whole lot of things, these things we called no regrets moves that we could take and say, well, all right, if we build separation for this business and create clean line of sight, clean p and and intercompany agreements or intercompany agreements, uh, in, I don't know, 
uh, somewhere in the company yep. agreements, that that was going to benefit us because we'd manage the business better, but it would also benefit us if we then chose to, to sell. And so we looked for opportunities to do those no regrets moves. Very good. Next question. This is a hard, this is a hard one. So um, I want to talk about open versus closed. Uh, so the walled gardens have uh, reaped enormous economic benefit by operating closed data systems. And they've been, if anything, they've been increasingly uh, closing them. Uh, and yet the, the, I would suggest that the marketing ecosystem writ large has been hobbled by this opacity um, and uh, really needs a more open architecture. Now enter LiveRamp. I could make the argument that you've established a certain level of hegemony in the identity space, which gives you a similar economic opportunity. So I guess my question is, as Scott Howe sits there today, how do you manage these uh, arguably conflicting um, sort of uh, opportunities of, on one hand, you know, your inner voice is saying, hey, you could be the hero. You could provide identity to everybody. On the other hand, you could turn this into a monopoly money machine. Yeah, that's an easy conversation. Uh, and it's easy for, for two reasons. One, because I've lived this before. And so, you know, 15 years ago at Aquana, before it was acquired by Microsoft, uh, a, a, a Quantum at the time had a business called Atlas, and Atlas had about 45 share to double clicks, uh, uh, 50 share or so on uh, buy side ad serving. And our vision was to create something that was neutral and agnostic for the world. Uh, and we didn't. Uh, it got bought by, by Microsoft, and, and you know, great outcome for shareholders, but uh, it's always weighed heavily on me. Uh, and, and in thinking about what was going to be the Encore Act, uh, you know, it was all about uh, being neutral and agnostic because I, I just felt like the world needed this. And uh, what I would tell anybody, and many of you are our partners, is uh, one, we are neutral and agnostic. There are companies that compete against us in our space that license our graphs sitting out in the audience um, today, and they're great partners. Uh, and, and, you know, we will, if you, if you want to be neutral and agnostic, you can never bend the rules. It, you, you have to self-regulate. Uh, and so that is uh, written into our values. And for any client who has any doubts about that, we say, well, then write it into your contract. What is it that you need to make sure that that never, ever happens? Um, so it's just, uh, I, I think the... The industry is well served by someone neutral and agnostic for the good of all in the industry. That's what we're going to be. So great. Uh, final uh, question is really we're going to you're going to channel uh, Dave Eisenberg here on this one. So um, I want to talk about your approach to M and A, which I would suggest is akin to what we experience with the large tech companies, which is you do your upfront work, your diligence, your strategic thinking around prioritization and identifying the right targets. Once you've done that, you come in hot and heavy with fair or some cases more than fair terms. You're welcome, Hochter. Um, and, and, and you come hot and heavy in order to lock the deal down. Talk about that approach to m and It's one that companies much larger than yours have very successfully executed in order to ensure the high probability that they get what they want uh, and within a reasonable amount of time. Well, I'll tell you, Terry, I, I learned the lesson on this the hard way and without talking about the company. I mean, there was someone early in my Axiom career that we really liked and knew the team and had great relationships with. They wanted to join Axiom and, and we said, well, what's the price gonna be? You know, tell us what the winning price is gonna be. And, and they told us and we came in at exactly that and went to bed thinking, love this and woke up the next morning to find out one of the marketing cloud providers had outbid us and we lost a deal for you know, $10 million or something ridiculous like that. And, and you know, what I would say is that um, deals don't work. Private equity is one thing, but in the corporate world, um, deals either make sense strategically yep. and then they'll make sense financially or they don't. 
And so, you know, we were criticized for way overpaying for LiveRamp, and again, uh, more recently for Data Plus Math. But I will tell you that after a year or two uh, in LiveRamp, like it quickly proved to be, you know, an incredible acquisition. And I think the same is going to be true for Data Plus Math. That, like, never be uh, penny wise and pound foolish. Yep. Very good. Well, uh, for all you strategics out there, that's good advice. Uh, at least that's what we would say. Uh, but no, it's proven that you know you get the right target, you know, plus or minus on the price. That's irrelevant. If you get it right, you you it it uh, has huge huge rewards. Well, uh, Scott, thank you. You you know, if you recall, way back in the day, I remember when you took the job uh, at um, at Axiom uh, back in the day. In fact, I'm pretty sure this was my first book creative cover. Uh, Stuck between Little Rock and a Wet Place, uh, a how-to guide, um, because of all your travel back and forth. Scott, thank you the very gem much. Gem of a city. Absolutely. Uh, I, I vouch for Little Rock. <laughs>